very much for, for coming. Uh, this is a very different type of Airtree <laughs> event. As you know, we're a venture capital firm uh, that invests in software solutions. We don't invest in genomics because we don't understand it. Well <laughs> <laughs> and we only invest in things we understand. But, you know, as, as human beings with um, curiosity, we uh, are interested in other things other than just software. And one of the interests that uh, I particularly have, and I'm happy that my Airtree colleagues agree with, is in the area of, of really of health and of genomics. Um, and so it's a bit of a background to why Vanessa is, is sitting here. Uh, uh, nearly, initially about uh, 15 years ago, we started our journey as a family investing in uh, medical research. With initial, was a, a chair in the, at the Garvin in breast cancer, which has now become a chair in cancer genomics. And that was through a process working for my old boss, Bill Gates, about, you know, you should try and think about cures, not just um, trying to treat people. And subsequent to that, we started thinking about what else we wanted to do. And we then, uh, it was clear that when, when tracking the breast cancer journey, there was so much money pouring into breast cancer in Australia. And not, not, it's, not, it's not a bad thing necessarily, although there's clearly some money going to bad research. There's no question there's bad research being funded in breast cancer. And we found that when we set up our chair, that there was, there were, there were some scientists who weren't that good getting money which is a bad thing actually because the good scientists don't get enough. But then what was clear was that, you know, there's another cancer, uh, a hormonal cancer, <laughs> or sorry, cancer that um, was killing men and no one really cared about it. <laughs> and that was prostate cancer. And in fact, the death rates were at a very similar level to breast cancer. And breast cancer had this amazing amount of funding. And there was, you know, there was some programs starting to get funding, but it really wasn't being funded well enough. So we said, uh, my wife, I said, let's fund the chair in breast cancer, in prostate cancer research. Um, but learning from the experience of the uh, uh, breast cancer was we didn't want to fund average research. That was just not interesting. And so the challenge we gave to the, to the, to, uh, the Garvin was uh, we need to find someone, the best in the world. Who's the best in the world? Who can we get that's the best in the world? And, uh, you know, that's, it sounds like a stupid thing to say as an Australian sitting here, who are the best in the world? Um, but as luck would have it, um, Vanessa, Professor Vanessa Hayes, who had been working in Australia, but then had gone ahead, I'll read through some of her, I've got 12 pages for CV, <laughs> it'll take me an hour and a half to read through. Um, she was coming back to Australia, and it's one of those absolutely fortuitous things where, you know, one of the world's best researchers in a particular disease condition happened to be coming back to Australia, um, and so we were very, very fortunate, in fact, blessed to have someone of her calibre uh, to be involved with the Garvin which is, of course, is one of Australia's top two medical research institutes. Maybe the top, the top two <laughs> will be generous, um, but clearly moving the dial. And, and our whole thing was, can you get someone who can help move the dial? And that's Vanessa. So let me just uh, go through Vanessa's background. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's super interesting. So she's the Petri Chair of Prostate Cancer Research, uh, adjunct professor of me medical genomics at the University of Sydney. She ha also happens to be a co-joint professor of medicine that's in, in school, uh, clinical school. She's an adjunct professor also of genomics at the Craig Ventnor Institute. Now, for those of you who don't, fellas, Craig Ventnor was the guy. <laughs> well, not just the guy, but he was, uh, led the team that sequenced the first genome in 1993 at a cost of $3 billion. Um, and without that breakthrough, none of this would have happened. And for Vanessa to have worked as part of that team in and of itself talks to the caliber of the person she is. Um, she completed her PhD at the University of Groningen. Groningen. That, that's the one <laughs> in the Netherlands <laughs> in 99. Again, just defined genetic landscape, key regulators and genes, so right from 99. She returned to South Africa briefly, headed a genetics, gen genetics laboratory focused on genetic risk factors associated with HIV and AIDS. Her interest in prostate cancer was spa sparked by the late Professor Chris Haynes, who died in 2014 of, uh, I assume, a related cancer. In 2003, she joined the Garvin Institute, yay, when the first time she got involved with us, where she led a cancer genomics group focused on defining prostate cancer gene risk factors. Then she worked, this work was awarded her the Cancer Institute uh, Premier's Award for Cancer Research 2007, Australian Tall Poppy Award for Science 2008, Australian Academy of Science inaugural Ruth Stevens uh, Medal in two, uh, for Genomics 2008. Then she moved to the Children's Cancer Institute to establish uh, one of the country's first next generation sequencing laboratories. Uh, and it goes on. I will say that um, she returned 2014, yay, uh, uh, full time to Australia and the Garden Institute as, as the Professor uh, of Cancer Research. Her interests 
You know, I saw this. You know, my is interests are red wine from Spain. You know, so <laughs> hers are human genomics, human diversity, genome mapping, prostate cancer, cancer disparities, cancer genomics, genetic epi, epi, epidemiology, population genetics, human revolution, human migration, human adaptation, southern Africa, indigenous genomics, mitochondrial genomics. Genomic technology, and I'm sure solving third world poverty. Is that, <laughs> is that the one that's missing off the list? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot of this. So look, we're going to try to traverse a lot of things today, but the thing that uh, we'll get to prostate cancer, but the thing that I found most fascinating about uh, talking to Vanessa early on was the origin of the species. And she talks eloquently about uh, where we, Homo sapiens, whether we've been around for 70,000, 100,000, something like that, years, um, where we came from and how that whole sort of journey uh, occurred. So that's where we'll start, and then yep. we'll meander along towards cancer and genomics and other things and take <laughs> questions from the floor. Okay. Over to you. Well, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for that introduction. It really makes me sound super strange, but um, <laughs> yeah. I think you have to be strange to do this job um, because we only do it out of passion, and uh, certainly that's what I've done. So as you heard from Daniel, I'm a genomicist. I've always been interest in, interested in DNA, and... Um, what you also heard is, yes, I was born in South Africa. This is not why I go back to South Africa and to Africa to do a lot of my research, but actually that's where all of us here in this room actually come from, believe it or not. We do come from Africa. Um, so actually I use DNA to tell the story of all of us. Now in the past, when you think about the story of mankind and where we all come from, we actually could only rely on archaeology. That's all we could rely on is evidence of human beings, evidence we were walking up straight, evidence of fire, jewelry, whatever it is, and as well as skeletons. Now there's a slight problem with that, and I'll give you a great example. How many of you know that there were three mammoths? And there were three mammoth extinctions. One at 60,000 years ago, one at 30,000 years ago, and one only about uh, 10 to 3,000, no, 10,000 years ago. Those are the little miniature ones. Now, the miniature mammoth, that was easy. Their skeletons were pretty small. But the other two, there's absolutely no difference in their skeletons. And it was not until we were able to sequence DNA, read the DNA code of these mammoths, this paper came out in 2008 from one of my colleagues, that we were able to show there were two very different species and they went extinct at different times. We were also, we, my colleagues were also able to show in this paper that mammoths were actually younger than elephants. So you always think of the ancient mammoth, but actually elephants much older. So that's why we can use genomics and use DNA to sell the story of anything we want to, really. It's still, in fact, if there's life out in space, I'm sure it's going to be DNA that tell us it's there, mm -hmm. because DNA means life. So we use DNA, and how does this actually happen is that DNA changes over time, and that we call a molecular clock. So the closer you are to someone or something, the closer your DNA sequence is going to be. So I'm sure you've all heard that we come from chimps, and you've all heard there was a chimp, and then blah, 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 and we got taller and taller, and then we shrank again because of the computer and Daniel stuff. And that's the story. Thank right. you very much. Right. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, I hate that picture because that picture is very, very misleading. Yes, we were related to chimps at some point. And the reason we know that is our DNA is only 1% difference between modern humans and chimps. But the chimp that had his DNA sequenced actually lives right now, today, in San Diego Zoo. The man, not a chimp, but Craig Venter that you heard about, who had his DNA sequenced, he still lives also in San Diego, not in the zoo, sometimes we think he does, <laughs> but in his house in La Jolla. So we got Craig, we got the chimp, both had their DNA sequenced, and both still living today. So ignore that straight line picture and realize chimp here, Craig here, common ancestor somewhere up here. We know that that was about four and a half to five million years ago. And we shared a common ancestor with the chimp. Who knows what that common ancestor looked like? We don't know. But it certainly doesn't look like the chimp or Craig or a mixture of, well, probably a mixture of both. 
Um, but that's the reality. So you've got to picture that, that there's always a branching, a branching. And we can trace ourselves back to the um, gorilla and to the orangutan as well. So coming further back, what people also don't realize, and it's a hard concept for people to understand, is that we weren't alone. There were many hermit species walking around. Um, at around three million years ago, we know of Australopithecus. Um, you've probably heard of Lucy. Lucy is the most famous of the skeletons. But actually, there were many, many Australopithecus, and all of these species were living in Africa. Most of the skeletons found are either in East Africa or Southern Africa. So there's always this contention between East Africa and Southern Africa. But remember, what you find is always based on your environment. In Southern Africa, there's this wonderful cave. It's called Cradle of Humankind, Stagfontein Caves, where all these species were running over the land, fell into the caves, died, and left a lovely graveyard for um, archaeologists to find all these species. So at least three Australopithecus species have been found. Um, just about a, a, an hour's drive north of um, Johannesburg. So Australopithecus we call man-ape, but their true relationship to us we don't know bar from skeletons because sequencing DNA of something that old is still pretty, pretty hard because the longer it's been around, the more degraded it gets. And of course, in Africa, it's not living in a nice freeze like the fridge like a mammoth does in Siberia. So coming further back, more towards the time we appeared. Um, we had lots of archaic species, we think at least four, um, by the time modern humans appear in Africa. Of course, the most known one is Neanderthal. And um, we have been able to, colleagues at the Max Planck in Germany, in Leipzig, have been able to sequence the DNA from Neanderthal. And what has been fascinating by using DNA is prior to that point, we never knew whether Homo sapiens, us, had actually met the Neanderthal and interchanged with the Neanderthal. And my colleague, Svanti Pavo, who leads all this research, I always say to him, you have the best job in the world because every publication you write, you correct yourself and no one worries about it. <laughs> the more skeletons he has to sequence, he pieces another pick a bit of the puzzle together, and sometimes he proves himself wrong. So originally he said there was no intermarriage between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens sapiens. But then he was only looking at the mitochondrial DNA. That's what we inherit from moms only. But when we were able to look at the entire DNA, he said, ah, there is Neanderthal DNA in modern humans, but it's only coming from the male line. You call it whatever you want to. So they, we had these archaic species. None of them are around today. We know that Neanderthal were the last to go to extinct between 25 and 30,000 years ago. So we're learning more and more from DNA. New species found in 2011 called Denisovan. A little finger was found and a tooth. They sequenced and it's a different species to Neanderthal. Separated about a million years ago. Okay, so as we're finding more, we will find more. So who are we? So we, like Neanderthal, like the, uh, the Australopithecus, like chimp, like gorilla, like orangutan, we all start in Africa. And that time is around 200,000 years ago. Um, if you look at archaeology, um, the oldest specimen discovered is around 195,000 years ago, found in the Omar Valley in East Africa. If you are um, a genomicist like myself, I'm a little bit biased to Southern Africa because the oldest genetic material of modern humans are found in Southern Africa. And these are the populations that I work with. So how do we, we use DNA, we use archaeology, both of that. We are definitely 200,000 years old. We emerge out of Africa. So one concept that is very, very hard for people to understand is the fact that the closer we get to our human origins, the more diverse someone's DNA, the more changes, the more diversity within a population and between a population. Now, if we think of most people sitting in this room, if you are Eurasian or Australian in general, Aboriginal Australian too, and you live outside of Africa, you come from only a thousand people. That's it. 
no more than a thousand. Yet we populate most of the planet. So it's kind of like a jar of jelly beans, all the different colors. Those were in Africa, and a few spilled out. And that made all people outside of Africa. So actually, there's a lot of ge genetic similarity in this room. And, uh, and we can discuss later how that affects disease. So, so far, the genetic data is telling us that um, we all come from one successful migration, which happened roughly 70 to uh, 60,000 years ago. That migration um, occurred and then populated the outside of Africa, meeting Neanderthal, meeting Denisovan, and as I say, we can talk to that. Well, my research is going more back to the 200,000 years ago. What I've been looking for in my lab is can we identify populations that actually, um, when we trace them back, represent a much earlier time frame. And we have found such a population. They called the Zikwasi. I hope you can all repeat that. <laughs> Zikwasi. <laughs> Who's seen the gods must be crazy? Yeah. Yep. OK, they are Zikwasi. Now, there are many click speakers in Southern Africa, of quite a few languages, but they're pretty much dying out. But the Zutwasi, we can trace their heritage back to 172,000 years. That means they have not intermixed with anyone else for 172,000 years. We do not see any evidence of that in their DNA. So they represent, as we all lived for 190,000 years, as hunters and gatherers. They still live today as hunter and gatherers. The last 10,000 years, the globe experienced agriculture, population expansion, and a world of human diseases we're all facing. And all these messages are in our DNA. I think I'll leave it there to let you ask questions. Well, <laughs> one, of the, one of the data points I thought was interesting when you talked about how many maternal lines exist in Africa versus maternal lines of, of DNA that exist outside of yep. Africa. You talked about a thousand people, but how many maternal lines do we all come from, us who are in Africa versus in Africa? Two. 38 inside of Africa. So I, I mean, I know yeah. you guys, I that most incredible, fascinating that the rest of the whole world, yeah. um, Eurasian, Asian, yeah. everyone else comes from two maternal lines. Correct. And the best part of that, is, I think, is being able to go up to a white supremacists and say, you're actually black. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, yeah. That's just super. I think that's fantastic. So, <laughs> so we, we did honestly have a lot of fun with that because the first African to have his DNA sequence was what we did, our project, which was um, sequencing the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And we sequenced um, uh, Tlubi. And sure. Tlubi is not a, a Zutwasi. Uh, Tlubi is a Thai person, but he's a click speaker as well. And um, what we learned from that, um, because obviously the Archbishop being a religious man, it was very interesting when I had discussions with him about, hey, you're 200,000 years old. Um, we can talk about that later. But what the Arch said to me is, isn't it brilliant that we're all brothers and sisters, essentially? So all these wars, all these battles, all these fights. He said it's just super cool we all come from Africa, though, of course. <laughs> um, but what we were able to show the Archbishop is his maternal line actually was Kusan, was from the land, was one of those click-speaking groups. And in the original paper in 2010, we missed diagnosed him, um, diagnosed him. We, w we mislabeled his maternal contribution because we had no more information at the time. And actually, he has such a unique maternal contribution. We landed up uh, a few years later, about uh, three years later, um, redefining him. Um, we found four people now on this globe who carry the same lineage as him. That's all. I, I, we've sequenced many. We cannot find anyone else. But it's so ancient and so unique. So he's carrying a, a lineage that's actually extinct. And I mean, he just thinks it's super, super cool. Um, he sent me photographs of his mother. And he never thought about it before, but his mother actually has very distinctive Kusan features. Um, but she was, she was classified, obviously, as African. But you can actually see the the phenotypic uh, resemblance of her heritage, which, which passed through her. So yeah, we, it's lovely to tell them that. We all black. So, yeah. <laughs> so how does the Australian indigenous population fit into that, into the maternal yeah. lines? And what, what, how okay. So um, well, first of all, I should say, if I take two people who click from Southern Africa 
and put them together, they will have roughly 80 changes in their mitochondrial genome. Yet I will own, have only 20 to someone who's Han Chinese. So you may as well call me Han Chinese, right? But none of you would. But the, to you, they look the same. Now, it's the same with Aboriginal Australians. I mean, very distinctively, you're going to say, oh, they look different. So don't be confused by phenotype. Because remember, one change in three billion letters, you get three billion from mom, three billion from dad, so six billion letters, right? All you need is one change to cause something very dramatic. So the Aboriginal Australians, um, this, uh, the story has changed many, many times um, because there's been very limited data um, due to many ethical reasons um, why Aboriginals have not been included in genomics. But now we are starting to get enough data. And the latest, um, it's changed over the years, but the latest data now coming out is Aboriginal Australians, like all Eurasians, come from the same wave out of Africa. They were incredible mi migrators, obviously along the coast, migrated very quickly to Australia. Along their migration route, besides meeting Neanderthal, like the rest of us, they met Denisovans. Them and the Melanesians will have up to 6% of, of their DNA being a completely new archaic species called Denisovians. Um, no one in Africa has any contribution. No one in Africa has any Neanderthal contribution. And none of the other um, Eurasian populations have Denisovan. So this is very unique to Aboriginal Australians, which makes sense. Um, obviously, their numbers would have been pretty small by that time. They enter Australia. One group migrates out up to, seems to be Papua New Guinea area. But then they migrate. Um, this is what the mitochondrial DNA is saying now. They migrate extremely fast around Australia. And it's almost like they meet at Adelaide and go, hey, dude, don't go that way. There's nothing there. And the other one goes, dude, don't go that way. There's nothing there. Because it's almost like they stop. And then that's it. And then you will see the different groups. Um, and so, yeah, you see it looks like there's this very fast migration. And obviously, as we get more and more data, uh, we'll start understanding more and more. And people, I don't know if they really appreciate with four hundred different Aboriginal languages, you really got to think of it as 400 different cultures. Um, we usually use language in our research as a proxy. Of course, it's a proxy. Someone can always learn a language, um, but it's the best proxy we have. So do the, do the limited number of DNA lines in Australia, as an example, make us more prone to disease conditions generally than a more diverse set of DNA lines? Yes. <laughs> so it makes us more susceptible. So when you, um, so a lot of people ask me why haven't I sequenced my own DNA? And, and I mean I've done enough genomic data on my own DNA, but of course I've got a freezer full of very interesting people. But what I have done in my DNA is you'll see what we call long runs of homozygosity. So my mother was born in Africa, my father was born in the UK. And I've got these long runs, which actually means my ancestors never left their village. Seriously, it doesn't matter they were born on two different continents. I can see in my DNA, no one left. And it's terrible. So what actually happens is if I meet someone else who's European or Asian, who has also these long runs, when a change happens, it's more likely to be massively detrimental. So I'm more likely to meet someone else with that same change. So what we do see in um, populations outside of Africa is more of these rare genetic diseases where they have really a dramatic impact. Um, obviously, they're the easiest to solve, but of course you don't want a child with one rare disease because there's going to be any drugs out there, so it may be easy to sort of find the DNA change, but you, you, you certainly don't want it. So in Africa, we tend to see uh, less of that because there's more variability within the populations. Um, but of course, um, in my lab, we study prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is a disease of common variation. So we are also interested in not only the rare variation, but also that common variation and how that contributes together. So yes, it's, um, Darwin actually had this theory with plants where, where plants would die and die and die when they were inbred. And eventually, it's like the... The, the lethal victor. It eventually says, no, we're going to survive, and it mutates itself to be better. But I, I don't know if we've done that yet in humans. And maybe for 
people here. Why the focus of prostate cancer research in, in Africa? Okay. Why there? So what a lot of people don't know about prostate cancer is um, we know that sort of one in six Australian men will get a diagnosis in their lifetime um, of prostate cancer. What people don't know though is there are three risk factors, age, nothing we can do about age, the Australian population is aging, so is the world population, we're all aging, so you can't do anything about age. But the two other factors are family history, and family history is um, if you have an infected father, your risk is so much higher, but also, more importantly, if you have an infected brother with prostate cancer. Um, that's why my lab's very interested also in the maternal DNA, because brothers, the only thing that they inherit the same that dad doesn't have is that mitochondrial DNA that you only get from mom. So sorry, dads, you don't give as much as mom does, but anyway, we give a little bit more. But it could be. So we have a, an interest in our lab also in that part of the DNA. We just don't throw it away. Um, but the third thing, which is very much ignored in the scientific community, is African Americans are at the highest risk for prostate cancer. There is a distinct ethnic disparity in prostate cancer. And let me just put that into perspective. If you are African American, you have a 1.7 fold higher risk of having a diagnosis of prostate cancer than if you're European American. You're 2.5 fold high risk of dying from prostate cancer, 10 years younger, and a five fold higher risk than of dying from prostate cancer as African American than if you're Asian American. So there's been many studies, because this has been known for a long time, there's been many studies done in the US to work out, is this a social or environmental factor that is causing this very distinct population diversity in this disease? So, African Americans the worst, then European Americans, and extremely low in Asian Americans. So there's been studies looking at Asians living in Asia, Asians living in America, the diet, blah, blah, blah. Basically, nothing's conclusive. It's back to this extremely strong. And what that tells my team is uh, genetics has to be a major player. No matter what, your DNA profile, what you inherit, and of course, all cancers are genetic. Because remember, cancer, all it is, is your cell. That's why it's hard to cure a disease that's you, right? It's your cell gone haywire. And what is causing that cell to change and to keep growing are genetic changes. So you inherit this genetic, con this genetic risk, plus on top of that, your cancer is growing in a specific way. Um, so we want to basically, in our group, um, allow Australian men to die with prostate cancer, but not from it. Um, because with one in six, pretty much um, we overdiagnose this disease. But what we see in Africa, um, so what we did was we went and started the, the biggest um, and largest and only actually um, prostate cancer study in Africa. We've been following this for um, 10 years now. And it's been pretty hard because we, we started in rural part of Africa. We didn't want to capture the urban uh, um, cities. Um, but we've discovered some really significant things because we have an extreme phenotype to look at. Now, for those men who's e who have ever had a PSA test, you'll probably freak out if the doctor says your PSA is 4 or hitting 4. In our cohort, 4,000, 5,000. These men are coming in with prostate, sorry, no one's eating, hanging out their anus. So it's a very, very aggressive disease in Africa. So if we go to the source of something being very aggressive, we're probably going to understand the biology a bit better. Um, so that's what we do, is we're looking for extreme cases. And what's the, we'll go to other disease conditions soon, but what's the path to a cure for prostate cancer? Where do you think that's... Okay. So at the moment, a path for cure for prostate cancer, treating prostate cancer, is a major problem. Um, we cannot clinically differentiate between men who just need to watch and wait, and basically we should call, not say they have prostate cancer, we should just say they have a funny thing in their prostates. Because honestly, nine out of 10 men who get a diagnosis should do nothing. We don't, no man wants to have a radical prostate and have their prostates removed if they don't need to. It's not very fun. But of course, how do we know that one in 10 who will metastasize and will die from it if we don't do anything about it? Now, at the moment, we don't have good indicators. PSA is pretty good once a man has had surgery to tell whether they relapse. But actually, 
as a definitive um, test, it's done nothing to mortality rates in Australia. Um, so what we want to do is find, can we use genetics and genomics because of the fact that we know this is genetic disease to give clinicians that tool. Um, so we go to our extreme cohorts because we know there isn't this noise of that prostate cancer we shouldn't call prostate cancer. Mm. We really want to define that disease that kills, not the disease that's not killing. Mm. And we should maybe not just call it a disease. Because mm. the theory is if you're autopsy, any man over 75 will probably say it's prostate cancer, mm. the way we diagnose mm. it today. Um, yeah. So one of the things that's been talked about as the sort of great hope for cancer is being immunotherapy. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, Keytruder is one of the, one of the drugs that people have probably mm -hmm. heard about in the case of um, advanced melanoma. Can you talk a bit about sort of immunotherapy and genetics and where you see that path going? Why, why is immunotherapy such a great white hope? Yeah. And um, how do you think it's... Uh, okay, I'm smiling now because I don't know if I have to shoot all of you if I say this, because <laughs> this is unpublished data. So um, a paper came out recently that actually showed, in fact, just a few months ago. So you want to explain what immunotherapy is better than I can? Oh, okay. Sorry, I so immunotherapy is, is basically using the body's immune system to um, fight the cancer, right? So it's, it's tailoring the actual immune system as opposed to tailoring the cancer, right? And let it fight itself. That's in a very sort of simplistic nutshell. Um, on the genomic level, so you mentioned melanoma. This, does, this can, type of therapy actually works really well with melanoma um, and works well with lung cancer. Now, you may realize that both of those cancers um, are caused by a mutagen. We know that melanoma is caused by UV light. We know that lung cancer um, by tobacco, by nicotine. Now, what actually happens to these cancers where there is a carcinogen, where something environmental that actually causes the cell to grow um, is it mutates like hell. It gets a lot of mutations. And we call that tumor mutational burden, right? And this paper that just came out showed that if you take someone's tumor and you sequence it, you read the DNA sequence and you see that it's gone haywire, there's all these mutations, and which is called tumor mutational burden, then immunotherapy is working well on these particular patients, but doesn't seem to work well on those that don't. Um, what we've recently discovered in Africa is they have a tumor mutational burden fourfold higher than what we've seen in Australia. If this is true, we potentially have a treatment option, and no one has a treatment option for prostate cancer. So this for us is very exciting. It's mixing the concepts of immunotherapy. How or why it's working, I don't know. But will immunotherapy be a general answer to no. general cancer? No, no. So the studies are showing that it's, uh, say, melanoma, it works for about 40% of cases. In lung cancer, I think it's lower. In prostate cancer, zero. But maybe but in African prostate cancer, it's In other cancer well. areas, what, does it have a role in breast cancer or ovarian cancer? It, or just, it just depends. There, there's all research coming out now mm. which is showing those differences. I only know really melanoma and lung. Um, the percentages, but yeah, those papers are given a real percentage, and of course, it's not just immunotherapy because immunotherapy can be a combination. So what they did say, show in this last paper is, if it's a combination drug of of the immunotherapy where it's targeting more than one part of the immune system, then it works better or it doesn't. And in this particular paper, it showed there was actually no difference because usually in cancer treatment, we would like to hit it with all, hit it with everything, but in this case, it doesn't look like it makes much difference. But that's going to be cancer dependent. Because remember, each, although cancer essentially is the same thing, it's not. Yeah. Um, each tissue, each site is very, very different. But we learn from one to the other. So one of the things you read about in the popular press about uh, the consequences of DNA sequencing is uh, you know, personalized medicine, mm -hmm. that um, I'll wake up next week and I'll have a, <laughs> a plan that will cure my disease, my specific diseases. And I think then it's, then it's moved, I think, more to more precision medicine. I think if it worked out personalised, probably wasn't going to happen. Hmm. So what does that really look like from within the scientific community, the idea of personalised? And personalised medicine being that because I can sequence my, D, uh, my DNA, or I can have it sequenced, therefore someone can tell me for my specific particular variant of a specific uh, disease condition, here is the exact right drug or therapy for me versus a generic just slam everything at it and see what happens. 
Um, so Correct. what's the sort of the reality of, of where we are in the world of personalized precision medicine and using okay. DNA in that, in, that, yeah. in that way? So at the completion of the Human Genome Project um, back in 2003, people were talking about this hype of, of treating a person based on their DNA sequence. And I suppose the expectation was that 10 years time, this would be the real case. Um, so there is a little bit of disappointment in the community. But that's actually not true, because we've already been doing that for a long time, even before whole genome sequencing, when it came to rare diseases. Um, there are many cases at the Garvin now looking at rare diseases where we are identified in young children or um, rare cancers and actually being able to treat that individual. That is the same as precision medicine. When people think about precision medicine, they're thinking more of the complex diseases like prostate cancer and breast cancer. When can we treat someone instead of treating them in a box? Um, um, and, and when can we actually do this? Now, it, once again, it's dependent on the disease. A disease like breast cancer, pretty much you could probably put 25% of people in a box and do a quick dirty and be able to help them straight away. 75%, you'll have to go the precision medicine uh, route. Prostate cancer, that's why I love working on it. Probably all of them are going to have to go precision medicine route, and that's what the data is kind of showing us at the moment, which is obviously disappointing. Mm. So it doesn't mean we can't just mm. revamp everything, right? So you've got to know your disease. Um, is precision ma medicine reality? Yes, I do believe it is absolutely reality, and it is the future. It is not the Gattaca, but yes, I do believe we will be at a point where babies are born, foot is pricked, whatever it is, we sequence the genome, it stays in their file. And in that file, you can look at risk, you can look at drug development, you can say, right, you're at a risk to have prostate cancer, so you'll go be screened at 50, you don't need to, you can be screened at 60. Um, I absolutely do believe we are getting there, and there is enough examples out there where genomics is now being used to tailor drugs. Mm. Um, and we know the failure rate has been high when we don't do that. Mm. Um, so it is a matter of time. It is a matter of machine learning and computate time. And, and you know, we've got to catch up. The technology is caught up. Now we need the mm. compute power to catch up. And we just need more information into the pool. Should everyone have their DNA sequenced? I think everyone's going to have their mm. DNA sequence. I think, in, um, I think in Melbourne now, uh, at Melbourne Children's Hospital, they're sequencing all babies that yeah. are now born, yeah. having their DNA sequenced uh, yeah. as they... So back in the, the archaic days when genomics didn't exist and we still called ourselves geneticists, Finland led the, the world in, geno in genetics, actually. They were making the most discoveries because they made a decision many years ago to collect the blood of every child born. Um, because they knew they had a lot of inbreeding in their country because of their language being so different to the other Nordic countries. So m most of the major discoveries in genetics was coming out of Finland because they made that decision 20 years before anyone else in the world did mm. um, to actually do that. But in those days, they were just doing it on a collect the blood, have it there, have it stored. Mm. If a kid has something, we can uh, go in and, and find it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not open for questions, but just an interesting data point on, on pricing. You heard that 93 a cost of a... DNA sequence was $3 billion. Uh, my wife and I had ours done at the Garvin, I think, three years ago, maybe, and it was like $10,000. And what's the current retail price? You better ask them, because I know the price for well, research. Yeah, what's it now? It's $236 US now. Yeah. There, are a, there are a couple of price points at the moment, but yeah. the baseline price is set. Yeah, for yeah. full, for full genome sequence, yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's, and it, you've got to be careful with the 23 and Me kind of ones, which are not yeah. the full, G, uh, Full, full sequencing of the genome. Um, and yeah, and the National yeah. Geographic is just mitochondria. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, so they're different, but for the full one on your own little hard drive, you get, yeah. And so that's coming down dramatically, and so as we get that, that price down, more you'll get more, and the more clear, the more data sets we have, the better it will be. I th you'll think you'll see announced, uh, I'm on the Innovation Science Australia board, you'll see a major project being announced in the next month or so around the National Genomics Mission to extend the current work in that space. Let me open up to any questions from the floor. Anyone? Have any interesting, uh, Stephen? Vanessa, hi. My name's Stephen. Um, <coughs> by way of background, I was born in South Africa, and um, <laughs> I married Lucy, uh, who I can confirm. Hopefully, not born, the one up there. Who's been the source of all life in our family, anyway? <laughs> um, you mentioned at some point that um, cancer is really 
genetic because it's it's about my cell as it were so where there is absolutely no history sort of siblings or parents or grandparents mm -hmm. and assuming we're not talking about nicotine or, or okay. ultraviolet rays what what is the what does the research say about why you know a cancer occurs in one individual without if you like that genetic inheritance okay so, so when um this is a very confusing concept for scientists too, so don't worry. <laughs> when I say I'm cancer is genetic, it is the, the growth of the, the actual cell into a tumor cell and whether it becomes metastatic or not is a genetic process, but it's not necessarily dependent on what you inherit. You got that? So events are acquired over your lifetime and they're acquired um, in that cell which causes it to grow. Um, basically, um, Think of your cell as there are genes that um, will say the cell needs to grow and there are genes that say the cell needs to die. And those are working pretty well. And every day cells are growing, cells are dying, and they're all working very nicely. But what actually happens over time um, is your DNA mutates over time. It always, as you're sitting here, your DNA will mutate. And we have a little repair mechanism that goes along like Puckman and it goes, fix it, fix it, there's a mistake, fix it, fix it. As we get older, that just slows down. And that's why you can have someone who's smoked for 20 years and their repair mechanism worked really well and didn't, you know, they died of old age and someone, you know, smoked for five years heavily and repair mechanism gave them, didn't work too well. So that's really how it goes along. It's not fixing the DNA anymore and it starts mutating. And so it's the progress. So you don't have to have an inherited profile to have that initial event that starts the tumor. People who get cancers at a very young age, like breast cancer is one of the examples where women will develop breast cancer, say, in their 30s, they most likely were born with that initiating event that they inherited. And that's why I said around 25% of breast cancers, we can go to those two genes we know, BRCA1 and 2, and actually go look for mutations there within families because they probably have inherited that. We don't have such a gene in prostate cancer. One of the, so it, and I'll jump to the question, I'll get back to this, it, which I thought was interesting, when we did ours, um, so we did ours together, and we were the first couple, I think, to do it at the Garvin, so effectively when we did our genome sequencing, we knew our children's by definition. <laughs> um, so there was this sort of uh, process of if we know that, and we were testing for, for BRCA1 and 2 as well, because yep. my wife's family had a history of breast cancer, so if we found we were carriers, then there was a, guess what? Yeah. Um, fortunately, the girls, um, we don't, neither of us carried it, so yay, they don't have that. I guess we'll get breast cancer, of course, but not the, yeah. the BRCA1 and BRCA2. But, um, and there are a bunch of disease conditions, uh, bowel cancers, colon cancer, a bunch of those where you, you, by getting uh, the genetic um, uh, predisposition uh, mutations, you can go and have tests earlier or what have you. The one I found most fascinating was there are a bunch of uh, indicators for Alzheimer's. Um, yes, but of course, you can do bugger all about Alzheimer's. Maybe I'll do a few more Sudokus or something. But that's about <laughs> that's about where it starts and stops. So, wh what do you, do you do? You think people is it worth getting their DNA sequenced and being told about the markers for disease conditions that there are no there are no cures for or therapies for like Alzheimer's yeah, or? Yeah. So th you know that's a very good question. Um, okay. So first part, would you have your DNA sequenced now? Yes, I would. I do not think the technology is going to change too much as far as reading each base is concerned. I think we're at a point now where I'll very comfortably say, yep. Yeah. What we are learning is how to interpret that code every day. So you can keep that information there, but you have to re keep re-looking at it. So for the Alzheimer's example that you've given, um, it is really personal. Mm. So Jim Watson, Craig Venter was the first so the Human Genome Project, which ended in, in 2003, was a mixture of 20 people. So we couldn't say anything about a person. Craig Venter was the first person for $10 million to sequence himself. Um, that came out in 2007. He had no problem showing his APOE, which is the Alzheimer's, and he, he is prone. He's a predisposed mm -hmm. to, to Alzheimer's. Um, Jim Watson, who was the first to have his done using the new technology in 2008, chose to leave that information out mm. of his genome. And Craig obviously always makes jokes about that, but he decided to leave that, that information out. 
Craig's argument and, and many people's arguments is I'd rather know, and hey, because I'm a scientist, I can try to figure out you know, what I'm going to do about it. Knowledge is always better. I think it's personal at that stage. Um, it's, it does certainly help the Alzheimer's community, the research community mm -hmm. to understand. So uh, yes, as a scientist, I always believe in putting the information out. Knowledge is always better than no knowledge. But I think it's a personal mm -hmm. choice. But um, when we sequence Desmond Tutu, we as a joke sent him a book on all the risk factors. And one of them was, um, you should be tall. And as you know, he's awfully short. <laughs> um, so we, we, we actually did this as, as a bit of a joke, just to show how you know, everything's not black and white, um, especially with diseases like Alzheimer's, height, um, you know, so there were a couple of really, really humorous ones in there we threw in to, to have a good joke. Um, yeah, so we will learn more and more mm. as we start deciphering this, this code. But I was wondering if you could speak to the current state of gene editing. You know, we read a lot about CRISPR and those type of things and, and the impact that'll have on future generations. Yeah, well, um, at the, um, look, I mean, CRISPR is really revolutionizing our understanding. So the biggest thing with um, what we do as genomicists is we can read the code, and then sometimes we can very obviously associate something with a phenotype. We say, okay, that's obvious. But what we often don't know, for example, in our disease, like prostate cancers, we'll see in a a man or a family or whatever it is. Um, actually, today we're looking at a, an obese family. And we saw all these potential hits, but we don't know what they really mean. And that's where these technologies like CRISPR come in, where we can really use a model to say, well, what is it really doing in that gene? So the biology, we still have to understand. Because that then does help us. Either we can go and do gene editing or some sort of targeted therapy um, for that person. So it's not, a, it's not as, as um, hey, we're just going to go and fix up everything. It's not exactly like that. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, but is, is there certainly the technology. Is mo the most impact? Yeah, it's still um, too early. In it. Most impact? I don't know. I actually honestly haven't looked into what I think is the most uh, maybe you guys will know from Rob's work. Well, I, I what do you think? One particularly good case study is a case study that's really well known um, at Garvin and that we've had to find it. Yeah, well, uh, Alan, so a young, a young boy um, with a very severe uh, autoimmune disease who was in ICU at the point at which he was whole genome sequence, so very much a last ditch, oh sorry, thank you, very much a last ditch attempt to endeavour to diagnose a disease that he had been um, unfortunately suffering with for, for many, many years undiagnosed. Uh, what we, we were very lucky, I think, in that the whole genome sequencing and the analysis of the sequencing did identify the cause of the disease and, and most fortunately identified a, an existing drug that had already been approved for use in, in adults, um, which was then put to the, the Children's Hospital Ethics Committee to get very quick approval to um, be, be given to this young man. And thankfully, he had an incredible response to this drug and uh, is not only still with us, but is a completely different child as a result of having had that experience. However, when we, so I, maybe I'll just give a little bit more background to, in terms of the application of CRISPR in research at the moment and at the Garvin Institute. So we're, we're not using CRISPR in humans at the moment. Um, we're using them in the essential uh, research model of, of mice. And so in Alan's case, the, the team, this includes Professor Chris Goodnow, who's our Deputy Director, and, and many, many others, took this gene <coughs> identification and, and essentially recreated Alan's disease in a mouse. So using this gene editing therapy to, to uh, manufacture that gene mutation in a living model. But it wasn't entirely unexpected, the, the results, but what happened was that well, the, the mice are fine. And we know, looking at Alan's 
phenotype, looking at his clinical history, he was a healthy baby and he was actually fine until he was a, around the age of three. And at that point, uh, he, he had some exposure, potential environmental exposure, which triggered the disease. So he had the genetic predisposition, but the genetic predisposition alone was not enough to result in the full-blown disease. He, he was exposed to something that led, led to the onset of the disease and the disease then progressed rapidly over multiple years leaving and eventually he was in ICU. So now what the team are doing is using the, the models, the mouse models of the disease and exposing the mice to the different environmental factors that they believe would be implicated in, in the disease or could be implicated in the disease to determine this very complex interaction of genetics and environment. So it's incredibly complex. It's a really good story in Alan's case because he's, he's, he's well, he's going to school, he's, this kid spent years in hospital, um, but it's not a cure. It's a very effective treatment, not a cure. And I guess the long-term goal, and correct me if I'm wrong, Vanessa, is then to apply th this technique, this gene editing technique in human models, but to do that very um, carefully because there's still a lot to be determined in terms of the long-term impacts of playing with genes. So I suppose a good example, I mean, remember models always a model. The mouse has been an aw awfully good model to all our scientists. But remember, it's not a human. And that's why we, there's a whole field called computational, um, called comparative genomics, where we actually are comparing across species. At the Garvin, we also use um, a zebrafish, for example. So there, um, mouse is the most studied model, though. So this is, this is a great example. Um, there's absolute benefit, but we always got to be careful. Um, another example, for example, is, is the same concept in a way, but um, not gene uh, editing but cloning uh, for example when Dolly was cloned Dolly died because Dolly essentially wasn't born as an embryo Dolly was cell was already old so there's always these these um, these uh, fundamental environmental issues we've got to take into consideration um, but yes the technology is I mean I'm sounding all negative now but the technology is advancing dramatically Alan would not be alive today he would not be at school today had it not been for the genomic revolution and for technology advancing. Having a genetic predisposition to something and then it being activated by an environmental factor, um, how is it different from what we're hearing about with epigenetics and their role in activating yeah. genes? Yeah. Okay. No, it's a very good question. Can you maybe describe epigenetics yeah. too? Yes. <laughs> so um, we all have the same DNA code. If you're an identical twin, right? Um, monozygotic twin, you're going to have the exact same DNA code. But what you won't have is the exact same epigenome. Um, so the epigenome is what we call above the genome. So basically, you have the code of A, G, T's and C's, but it can become methylated. Um, the C's can become methylated, and that actually will change. It will change according to your diet, it will change according to where you live, it will change according to your age. So when twins get separated at birth, as they did during the end of the Second World War, a lot of twins were separated. You will see slight differences in these twins. There's a lot will be the same because their code is the same, but this epigenetics, and we know that it's influencing a lot of things. It's influencing diseases. It probably is maybe influencing, in Alan's case, it will, um, a lot of the time, the epigenome um, will actually impact whether a gene will be turned on or off, for example, without actually mutating the DNA. So we've done some studies in Africa with the hunter-gatherers, for example. Although the DNA code can tell us which population each person came from, the epigenome is actually telling us where they lived. So it, it actually dictated what they were eating and where they were living. Now, we could actually separate um, people separately based on the epigenome. Which, so in other words, that's your environment. That's how much the environment is actually influenced. And we've got a big team at the Garvin Institute who's just focused on epigenomics and especially how the epigenome changes during a fetal development. It changes a lot. Yeah. Mm. Then that's the microbiome. So yes, we are very complicated. Uh, there's about 10,000 more fold more cells living in and on us 
than ourselves. And that's the, what we call the biome, so the microbiome. And we have our genome analyzed and also our so you, if, you, if you've got a lot of money and you want to go to HLI, which is Human Longevity Inc. in, in um, San Diego, um, then you can get your genome, not the epigenome, full epigenome yet. You can get your microbiome. You can even get um, immortalized cells made of yourself in case you do get sick. Yeah, so if you're, if you're prepared to spend millions, you know, spend a fortune, you, you can get that all from Craig. <laughs> It's a very select group <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Thanks, Vanessa. My name's Emma. Um, just uh, when we look back at medical history, we, we cringe at some of the things that we've done in the past, whether it's bloodletting or studying humours or whatever it may have been. Um, you know, over your long and varied career, is there anything now sitting where you are sitting today that you look back and say, oh, gosh, you know, that's what we did or that's how we interpreted data? I'd be really interested to you know, to, to hear from you or if it's not in your field, in other fields? Um, okay, very, very in-depth question. <laughs> okay, so um, I cringe all the time because I work in Africa um, at what scientists have done in the past and technically we, we are all scientists, whether you're just looking at making some observations. I was just, I was telling Daniel, I was just in Rwanda and um, obviously the genocide is still very fresh in Rwanda, it's only 23 years ago. But I was devastated to actually find out that part of the um, segregation between Hutu and Tutsi was technically scientists. I mean, they weren't really qualified scientists, but they were um, colonists, Belgium colonists, who started actually taking measurements of the facial measurements between the Hutu and the Tutsi and decided that these were just two different species of people, really, and decided Tutsi were better educated, well, the ones that they could educate and the Hutu weren't, and then swapped that idea later on, led to the genocide, uh, or contributed to the genocide. So yes, um, science has done some horrific things in the past, um, but more on the lines of um, naivety, I would say. Um, I, I don't think people, you know, um, often went out. Um, in my lifetime, um, certainly we've seen complete changes in, in ways of thinking. And um, most of the time I see the change limited by our technology. Technology has been my most significant driver in my field because um, I believe if we can look at a question differently, whether it's the technology, the population, the disease, whatever it is, if we can look at it differently, we're always going to get a different idea of it. Um, and you will find sometimes people are nervous to look outside of that box. So I see where maybe as a scientific community where we do fail sometimes is being confined, confined by our own, whether it's our budget or um, by external factors and not to take that risk and say, hey, I'm going to step outside the box and try and answer that question because then it opens a whole world. But it's not always accepted to look outside the box. I think, an, an, I mean, an interesting observation from our involvement with the garden has been you go back 15 years and it was a chair in breast cancer and I think at that time there were, I'll get the numbers wrong, but you know, there was like 20 types of breast cancer. They, were, they thought it existed you know, 10 years earlier, maybe 8 or 10. And then clearly the number of disease conditions in breast cancer exploded in terms of now you wanted to be in the bracket 1, bracket 2, that's where all the help was, but there were all these other disease conditions. And so the decision by the garden that you know, we need to think about this is more like and not just the garden, but, but others, that it's more about cancer that first was first exposed in the breast, as opposed to breast cancer, mm -hmm. quite a different way of thinking about it. It's more a tissue association. So in the way the garden's now taken our, our support and gone forward, it's now sharing cancer genomics. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a slight nuance to say, well, it's not just about the breast cancer, it's about cancer that is started the breast, but guess what? It resembles other cancers. In fact, there's, there's interesting mm -hmm. studies from the garden that show that you know some hormonal cancers express um, attributes to non-hormonal cancers, which is like it shouldn't be the case, right? That's just not the case. But so I think that's that sort of change, that, that, that sort of vertical silo. I think and what Vanessa brought to the garden, I thought, was this tremendous sort of fresh air of not being focal issues of prostate cancer, but the the approach was not a vertical boxed in approach to the disease condition, but more what are what other influencing factors are there across that we can learn. Any other questions? Perhaps two, two quick things. You, you mentioned the ability of genomics for 
much old population in Africa up to a couple of hundred thousand years old. Will, will technology help you find fragments of DNA that you can sequence to go right back there, or are you relying on remains falling into something, some obviously not a Siberian fridge like the, you have there, but, <laughs> but some solution that has preserved them for some reason beyond the couple of thousand years that we've talked about? And, and perhaps secondly, could you say a little more about the sand people in, uh, in Namibia, in the desert there, um, and how, if you can separate the effects of their ancient uh, genetics and health from that with the complications of their susceptibility to modern diseases, TB and smallpox and all the things that have, have harmed them, um, you're, you know, you've had a lot of experience with them and, and we haven't talked much about that. So they do represent the oldest lineages. Um, and they, um, so I said this would glassy date back to 172,000 years, and we've got a lot of lineages coming off um, the Kusan people that, that are living there. What um, we are actually learning from their DNA is we're not going to be able to help them, per se, with their health issues because their populations in themselves is very small. Most of the populations I work with don't go to Western doctors in any case. So what they gain from this is that their youngsters are proud of who they are. So that's actually what they want to get out of this, is, is us saying, hey, you are important. Um, you have been here a long time, because they know that. Um, but that, that's what they gain out of it. What we, um, we've actually just uh, done a big project um, with Sequence 200, um, the Kusan individuals. And the state is just finishing uh, being processed now. And um, the reason we're doing that, the reason Garvin was keen to fund that, is because that um, we don't actually know what it is to be healthy. So we talk a lot about disease, but what it does it mean to be healthy? Now, if you think of the modern day Australian, we've been kept alive since the day we were born. I mean, I certainly know my daughter wouldn't be around if she didn't have fantastic hair that she had, for example. We've all been going to Western doctors. But these hunter-gatherers in Namibia have never been to a Western doctor. Their life expectancy is around 75, which is not bad, for running around the bush. So they are the closest representation, and they have all this genetic diversity, of what is a healthy genome, or what is healthy variation. So when we um, discover some variation, like in Allen, we want to go to a database and say, well, has that been found in a whole lot of um, Kusan running around the Kalahari Desert with no issue? Because remember, a sick bushman or hunter-gatherer is a dead man. You can't be sick. So everyone asks me, how many sick people do I see? No, I don't see sick people. Sick people are dead people. Because if you can't hunt or gather, you don't belong. It is your duty to go and die. And I mean, it's as practical as that. So their, their genomes do represent the closest to Darwin's sort of natural selection over time. We don't. Um, so at the Garvin, we have a database of now 4,000 men, to, well, just over 2,000 have been completed, uh, not men, people over the age of um, 75 who've had their genome sequenced and we have all the medical history. And so we say they're pretty healthy, they're still alive, they don't have any cancers, whatever. But now by con contributing, but remember I told you everyone outside of Africa doesn't have a lot of diversity. So there's a lot of rare, not common variation in this database. So now we're contributing the most extreme database of ancient variation of people who've been managed to live for 172,000 years at the same age as going on. So that's how it's going to help modern medicine, is to go back to this database and say the genome and humans can handle that variation that they can't. Um, so that's the biggest, I think, uh, contribution. And um, the other thing that we do learn is there are very distinctive um, adaptations from our hunter-gatherer lifestyle to our current lifestyle. That is why many of the Kusan were wiped out, exactly what you said, smallpox. There were three uh, smallpox um, um, attacks in, in South Africa. Um, therefore, Kusan in South Africa don't exist anymore. Um, they've all been wiped out. Um, and we see that in our hunter-gatherers in Namibia. None of them are resistant to malaria, where most of the population has a genetic adaptation preventing them from malaria. 
they don't have that resistant. We could go to the Namibian government and say, do not bring elephants into this region because they will bring in water holes, you bring in water holes, you bring in mosquitoes, you bring in mosquitoes, or the bushmen will die. Um, they're all lactose intolerant. So lactose tolerance is a mutation. We were all lactose intolerant. Um, there are many features. They are able to live seven days without drinking water. They are able to store food and water in their buttocks. They have uh, no hair on their body. So that all these adaptations, they've um, adapted to be able to live in the climate that they do. So these are the other things that we're learning from, from the uh, Kusan population. Maybe one last question. Anyone's got? Um, I'm interested in what roadblocks you currently have that are outside of your industry. I mean, sometimes you look at politics and the, and the news and you go, if that wasn't there, I'd be able to move so much faster. Is Money. That, <laughs> money? So is, is that the, the biggest roadblock or is it people getting all the data in the system? Like, what is it? Yeah, no, seriously, actually, it's not a joke. Money is the, is the biggest roadblock. I'm, for example, this, this prostate cancer study, we only did it on six men, um, but that cost $50,000 just to do it on six men. We have to do 500 to be able to say, hey, that discovery is real, but we could completely change the treatment. Um, to do 500, I did the calculation, back of the envelope calculation, just for the reagents is going to cost my group $3, uh, $3 million. Um, you know, so yes, it is the it is the rate limiting factor. Although obviously the cost has come down dramatically, um, when we sequenced the archbishop, that cost 2.2 million US dollars just for the reagents to sequence the arch. Um, you know, and 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 that was why Australia was not in the field of genomics because we just could not afford, with the size of our population, and that kind of budget to to be in the game. So, yeah, that's the only reason why. So it is the most rate limiting. Um, sequencing is not rate limiting anymore. With the technology we have at the Garvin, 18,000 genomes a year, complete human genomes at full coverage is what the capacity is. So that's not limiting us. Compute power is not limiting us at the moment, um, but it certainly is more of a bottleneck than generating the data. We are very fortunate at the Garvin, though, um, that you know, we, we do have access to, to a huge amount of compute power, but um, it is costing a lot, a lot to store data, um, you know, putting it up in the cloud, how much of the data, you know, that sort of thing. So that's, you know, these bottlenecks sort of get ironed out um, as we go along. Um, but yes, the, the, um, the amount of data that we're generating has grown exponentially. So that is a, a major problem. It's, it's one of the strange things that Australia has part of when we first funded our first chair, which we've now funded three chairs in medical research, is Australia is, uh, punches above its weight extraordinarily when it comes to medical research. Um, in terms of, if you look at, uh, you know, I mean, these are proxies, but if you look at um, citations or patents or publications per 100 million of research, Australia is as good as any country in the world, US, anywhere. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, whereas other governments around the world are all increasing their spend in, in research Australia, governments have last of six, eight years of sliced, have cut research funding, which is just mind-blowingly stupid, given it's one of our great natural resources, and in fact, one of our global resources, and the impact is so positive. But uh, let me um, first uh, a vote of thanks to Vanessa. She's a super busy uh, a scientist, literally trying to save people's lives, where I just hang around on spreadsheets all day and um, feel very incompetent around you. But um, if you could join me in thanking her for coming tonight and uh, sharing the story. And, and thank you very much for making the time for what has been a very different um, Airtree speaker series. So thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Our oh, pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>